With the player and the coach, can you talk a little bit about how you see that impacting your job and the yeah. division now? I mean, you've been a coach for so long and, yeah. and how it's going to be not being the coach, but trying yeah. to impact the team. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When, when I first started coaching, um, I was still playing for the Houston Comets and then the Cleveland Rockers. So I can remember saying, like, one of the advantages that I have is I know what you feel like. You know, I've been in your shoes. And at that time, I was doing things concurrently. I feel similar about this new challenge for me is, you know, I'll be watching Kurt on the sideline and I'm going to know what he's feeling. Uh, I might not feel the same level of stress as he's feeling, but I'm going to know the angst of a bad call. I'm going to know the angst of a missed free throw um, or when the team uh, – uh, d defends in, you know, even if they went over something in shoot around on how to defend and they defend incorrectly in a game, I'm going to see the angst on his face. Um, so I think basketball wise, there'll be a, a good translation for me to understand what him and his staff are going through, but more importantly, what it is they need to continue to be successful. Um, I, you know, leadership is leadership. Uh, I've been managing my whole life. Um, since I was 25 and took over at Hartford, I had to manage a staff and I had to manage a budget and I had to manage, um, navigate my, my way through um, administration. So uh, I, I feel like even though I've never been in a position like this, I've been preparing for it my whole life. And I, I'm ready, you know, and I know I have a lot to learn. But one of the things I've learned in my career is that you surround yourself with really good people uh, who make you look good and that work tirelessly um, to help you be successful. And I plan to do that here. Hi, Jen. You just actually mentioned it, uh, surrounding yourselves with people that can help empower you to do great things. And on that note, with Kurt, just having known him for as long as you have, yeah. from your days at the college level to now, what have you seen from him uh, that's impressed you the most about what he's done in Connecticut? And what do you think, what are you excited about the most to work with yeah. him moving forward? Well, it's funny. I, you know, I don't know that um, college basketball coaches always translate well to the professional ranks, um, whether it's in the NBA or the WNBA. Um, so I've just always been impressed with how he's been able to transition from being a college coach to being the coach in the pros, how he teaches the game, um, how, he, how hard he gets his team to play, uh, how he can rally around, you know, whatever motto he needs to motivate his team to be successful. And I think most importantly, how he's put together the right group of people um, here in Connecticut. Uh, you know, I know that there was a lot of personnel changes um, in the, you know, beginning of his career, and he trusted this young core group of players, and he's allowed them to, to ride this team to, you know, almost winning a championship two summers ago. And I think that that's a really invaluable quality to have as a head coach, is being able to impose your will on a team, but also have... Um, you know, the security to know that these are, you know, grown women who have, you know, their own identity and have personalities and know the game well, and they do this for a living, and giving them some freedom to create, you know, kind of the identity that the identity that this team has created over the last few years. So I think it's just really meshed well with, um, you know, who we are in Connecticut. I know, at least when I played, we were not the overdog like UConn is now. I mean, we were the underdog. We were fighting for respect. We were fighting to be recognized. Um, so I know what it's like to have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, and I love that him and his players have the same and are, are looking to, to fight for everything that they have and prove that they're a championship caliber organization. Hi, Jen. Charlie Carroll with The Athletic. Kurt had talked about how he knew right away he wanted to reach out to you. How did that come about on your end, and how did you know this was the place to go, just that kind of process. Yeah, I, I mean, it was a process. That's a good word for it. Um, you know, obviously, um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, it was March 15th, and I was surprised to get let go at, at GW and um, really was not thinking at all about what was next. Um, I knew that I was a little bit burnt out, <laughs> that I needed a break. I needed to take a breath. Um, and then be able to consider what was put in front of me. And, and this opportunity came up pretty quickly, or at least the idea of it. Um, and it became more of a reality as the weeks went on. And, and, and I, as I said earlier, I started to talk to more people in the organization. 
you know, I met with Dave Martinelli and Don Trella and then Kathy Reagan Pine and her sister Beth. And um, the same themes kept reoccurring in all of my conversations. And that was culture, that was family, and that was support. Um, and I knew based on where I was coming from over the last few years that I would not be able to step into another situation if I didn't have all three of those things. Uh, I'm fine about, I'm fine being all business and getting the job done, but I want to have fun while I'm doing it. And I want to enjoy the people around me and make sure that we're, we're competing together to be the best that we can be and that we have a bunch of uh, people in our organization that are all in to, to, to the end goal. And I felt that theme being pretty consistently permeated through the entire process, that this was a place that was going to embrace me, welcome me home, value my skill set, work with me on the things I needed to be worked on with, um, but, but definitely recognize that I could have an impact on the organization, maybe in a way that others haven't so far. Um, so I'm excited for the opportunity. I'm flattered. I'm um, humbled, to be honest with you. Um, that I would even be considered, um, and it makes me even more determined to make sure I do a great job. Jen, obviously the Olympics are this summer. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about your role with USA Basketball, what that's going to be, and yeah. how you plan to, to balance out everything you need sure. to do with this new job and that job? Yeah, so um, it's, it's not often that you get asked to be an Olympic assistant coach. There's only three of them. <laughs> um, so this is a, certainly a dream of mine um, and not one that I was willing to give up. <laughs> and that was, I made that clear from the beginning that coaching in the Olympics would, would be my final coaching tasks of uh, 2021. Um, but I think again, the, the support that I've gotten from uh, Mohegan about um, wanting me to, to be here to lead the organization and understanding that between my family you know, balancing out my kids finishing school and having to move here and my USA basketball commitments throughout the summer, um, that I could be here and I could, I could do this job, but I wasn't necessarily going to be present every day of the summer uh, this year. Um, but again, like I said earlier, it's about surrounding yourself with people that are, are going to be there every day, putting the work in. It's about having an overall commitment uh, and making sure that I do a great job of communicating my vision as I figure out what that looks like um, that we're, again, the staff is in this together. Um, you know, in this day and age of, of a year of COVID, we've all learned how to work remotely and Zoom meetings and stay connected in different ways. And so certainly I'll have many opportunities to stay connected to the staff and to the team um, and just make sure that I'm giving what I can 100% of the time, um, but also fulfilling my dream of, of being an Olympic basketball coach. Hi, Jen. Nice to meet you. I'm Adam Betts with the Journal Inquirer. Um, obviously, you were one of the leaders in that UConn team, that first championship team. Is it kind of surreal to be back here in Connecticut and have the opportunity to lead the Connecticut Sun to their first title as well? It is. It is surreal. Um, I'm definitely somebody who loves to be the first to do something, you know, um, whether it's winning the first national championship at UConn or taking Hartford to its first uh, NCAA tournament. Um, I, I think that it's, there's something special about you know, having, being able to have that edge. Um, and, and Connecticut's a special place. Um, the, the, the people here embrace great women's basketball. Um, they're, you know, with no other professional sports, it's, this is the place to be. Um, I didn't have an opportunity to play a whole lot at the Mohegan Sun Arena. I think I overlapped one year when I was in Cleveland and I played here once or twice. Um, but I've been in this building before and I know what it sounds like and what it feels like. And um, I'm excited for our players to be able to play in front of, you know, some fans early in the season and hopefully a lot of fans late in the season. Um, but yeah, that's the goal. I mean, you know, they've gotten almost all the way there. You know, I, I can't take credit for the work that was done before I got here, but I'm certainly going to do the best that I can to help them finish the job. Congratulations. Thank you. Could you just speak a little bit about the importance of the 25th anniversary of WNBA being, you've been here from the beginning? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, I, I can remember the excitement of the league when I first went to Houston in, in 1999. I mean, we used to get like 10,000 plus fans in that arena. I mean, it helped that we were the defending WNBA champions. Um, and we used to travel to Washington and play against Shamiqua Holtzclaw and the Mystics and 10,000 people um, in LA 
and um, you know all the originating cities in the WNBA. And their excitement was was palpable at the time. But I also remember a time when it, people started to doubt whether or not the league could last. Uh, there were many years where it was like, well, what's the longevity of this? What's the job security for the coaches in the league? And is it really going to last? Um, and that talk kind of went out of the window, I feel like. The last decade, I, we have witnessed the best basketball being played ever on the women's side. Um, I, I can remember watching Tamika Catchings win the WNBA championship and thinking, this might be the best basketball game I've ever watched. Like just the level of play was so high, was so competitive. And as the league has, you know, smartly stayed compact and tight, we've seen more and more phenomenal players enter and make every single team really, really good. Um, we've seen every team have to fight tooth and nail every single night to get a, a win in this league. Um, it's hard to even be over 500 anymore <laughs> with how good the teams are in this league. So now we're at a point where in 25 years later, and my husband and I were talking about this the other day, he said, did you see the tweet where they talked about the 25th year of the NBA, they averaged 7,000 fans a game. You know, so we're still in our infancy as a league, but the trajectory of where we're going feels really good. Um, there's talk of expansion. There's talk of there being too many good players for not enough roster spots. Um, and so we're, we're going to make sure that we continue to set the standard uh, for fan support. Uh, we're going to continue to grow as a franchise so we can keep that conversation going, that we can expand the league, make, make sure there's more opportunities for women and coaching and playing in this league. Uh, we can continue to showcase uh, so many phenomenal women's basketball players in the United States instead of allowing so many of them to have to go play overseas. So it's pretty significant, not just because of what, um, how much the league has accomplished in the last 25 years, but just on the pre pre precipice of where we're heading, hopefully over the next 25. Um, hi, Jen. Uh, it's Jacqueline LeBlanc with The Next. Um, I'm wondering what your first conversations with the players have been um, and your interactions with them and if they have identified any off-court um, activities or priorities that are really important for them this season and beyond. Sure. Well, I just want to be clear that I'm not quite yet in the tier where I'm allowed to interact with the players, so I'm following the rules. Um, but we have had a, a Zoom meeting um, with the team last week before they got going on their first day of training camp. Uh, and it was more of just an introductory, introductory call um, where I was able to introduce myself to them, talk a little bit about how excited I was to be able to join the organization, join their team, um, and how excited I was for, for first day of camp. And, you know, so many of them, this is either their first camp ever or their first camp in Connecticut, and just talk to them a little bit about how it's going to be part of their journey forever. Uh, and that they were, and, and Kurt talked about, uh, you know, appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity to compete for a roster spot here. Um, so I haven't had a chance because there's so many veterans that are not uh, here yet. I haven't had a chance to connect or interact with the team a lot, um, but that certainly will be coming. Um, as, as Kurt mentioned, this is a team first organization and it's going to stay that way. Um, and hopefully they're going to look at me as somebody who's again, been in their shoes and understands um, the work that it takes to play in this league. Um, but also the sacrifices that so many of them have to make to be a professional women's basketball player. And we, we Kurt and I want to make sure that we're continuing to attract great free agents like Dewana Bonner to play here, but also putting them in positions where they can be more than just basketball players when they're here in the state of Connecticut. Hi, Jen. Ned from the New London Day. Congratulations on the new gig. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned this being a pivot for you, a change in jobs. Mm -hmm. What has prepared you along the way for jobs such as, you know, business operations and marketing? Uh -huh. um, well, like I, I um, alluded to earlier, um, s s when you're a coach at a mid-major, you kind of have to do a little bit of everything. <laughs> so when uh, a couple of the guys were, you know, interviewing me or talking to me about the job, they, you know, they asked about that in particular. And I said, you think that I haven't had to do marketing and ticket sales as the coach at the University of Hartford? I mean, it's like all hands on deck when you're trying to build a program. 
Um, so yeah, there are some, some positions that will need to be hired to support the areas that I don't have experience in. Um, but selling, I've been recruiting my whole life, you know, selling is like recruiting, you know, and I've been listening to these wonderful account executives on the phones the last few days and how hard they're working to provide service for, um, our season ticket holders and our fan base and, um, how, wonderful and patient they have been trying to explain the challenges of COVID. And, um, you know, you, you can hear the passion and you can hear um, the commitment to excellence in their voices. And when I asked them where they all came from, for most of them, this is their first job in sales. So you have to love sports. You have to want to talk to people on the phone. You have to be outgoing, right? They've all said this is their strengths. Um, but you have to love what you do and I'm going to love what I do. So I'm going to figure out the rest. Um, we've got a great product to market and we've got a great marketplace. It's not New York and it's not LA, but it's, it's different. It's New England and it's Connecticut and it's women's basketball capital. Um, and we're going to work hard to, to, se to sell this place out. Um, make it a, a continue to, to showcase a product that has been so good over the last few years. Um, and, and, and put ourselves in a position where um, you don't want to miss out. I, this, is, this is the time, like I said, to invest in women, in women's athletics, women in general. Um, and, and I think the league is prime for, for opportunity now for um, people in our community and corporations to really get involved in women's athletics. So I'm looking forward to the challenges and learning a lot about it and um, using the resources of Mohegan as well to make sure that we put the Connecticut Sun in the best position going forward. kind of have to ask this. Have you talked with, with Gino about the position and kind of what his thoughts are? Did you talk to him pre taking this job? Um, I talked to him. Um, yeah, the, like the week before I made the final decision. Um, so it was after I'd come up here. It was pretty tight lipped for a long time. Um, so but I wanted I've always kind of um, you know, you'd, he's been a mentor of mine for my career and, um, you know, his counsel has always been appreciated and certainly seeked out on my part. Um, and so as I'm kind of wrestling about, okay, am I, am I good here? You know, am I good, not, you know, not pursuing a coaching opportunity and pursuing this? Um, and the answer was pretty clear about not wanting to pursue coaching opportunities. Um, but did I want to make a, this, this pivot, you know, so drastically? Um, you know, his, his response was, he, he felt like it was a no brainer. Um, you know, it was, he thought it was a wonderful opportunity. Um, he was excited that I was in a position to, to be able to take advantage of something like this. So, um, fortunately, as usual, he was very supportive of the process that I went through and how I got to the decision of where I was and, um, excited about, you know, what I could accomplish here. Um, obviously he's a fan of Kurt. Um, he comes down to games. He's got many, many uh, former players playing in the league right now, so he's a big supporter of the WNBA, and he thought it was a great time for me to get involved. Hi, Jen. I know you said you haven't really gotten a great chance to get to know all the players yet, but you did mention the Change Can't Wait campaign yeah. in your opening remarks, and I'm just curious if you have a vision for both from a you know from the player perspective of how they've been putting equality and issues of equity and, and mm -hmm. anti-racism efforts on the forefront, but also representing you know, the Mohegan tribe and their efforts yes. for um, you know, equity and justice and all those um, fronts, how you see kind of that evolving as you're um, yeah. in this role as president. Yes, it's, it's, it's on my agenda of, of things most important to do. I don't know exactly the timing of it yet. Obviously, we, we need to get um, more of the veterans in market. A couple of them are still overseas. Um, and, the, and those are the, the women that are really going to, you know, make the most noise and, and want to represent the, the Change Can't Wait um, program the most because they were here last year when Amber started it with them. And they certainly are passionate about what, you know, what we can accomplish. And I think, as I said earlier, the women in this league, they're not just about wearing a T-shirt, you know, like they're, they're about action. Um, and, you know, I try, my husband and I try to talk to our family about this all the time, you know, that 
Um, it's not about a gesture or a t-shirt. It's about what, what can we celebrate that is actually making a difference. And when you look at what the women of the WNBA have done, you look at what the women of the Connecticut Sun had done, you can celebrate the actions that they took that made a positive impact. Um, and when we have so much to feel despair over, it's nice to have something to celebrate. Um, so it'll be a, a big part of the conversations that we have over the next few weeks. Um, you know, we won't be able to do a whole lot in the community until everybody's fully vaccinated. Um, but it, I am eager to hear more about what their passions are and how, what direction they want this to go in and how I can support them and um, continue to elevate their voices and create a platform for them to have, um, you know, to be able to fight the, the battles that they want to fight while they're here in Connecticut.